Hello and welcome to Sect Ed. I'm Patrick Reynolds. And I'm Michael Albany. In this episode, we're going to be taking a look at the life and times of Girolamo Savonarola, one of the most influential preachers of the Italian Renaissance, whose fiery sermons against the wealthy and powerful elite of his day earned him the label of heretic. Like in our episode on the Cathars, a series of wars, revolts, and coups will play a huge role in the development of this heresy. So we're going to start by giving a brief overview of the political and diplomatic situation in Italy at the end of the 15th century. Now, northern Italy, especially at this time, was a collection of many large independent city-states who were an extremely complicated and even incestuous mess with feudal aristocrats, Catholic theocracies, and merchant republics all ruling lands on top of each other with various power-sharing alliances that were different from town to town and city to city, and the balance of power between them always shifting, which made for some very intense and cutthroat intersections of faith, politics, and economics. So we've got to stress that this is just a simplified overview that only really covers the most important people and polities to the story of Savonarola and his sect. But the general political situation in Italy in the late 1400s was this. In the northwest, you have the city of Milan, which was ruled by Ludovico Sforza, a pretty brutal and tyrannical duke who was known as the Moor, and he controlled what was, by the standards of Italy at the time, a fairly formidable military force. In the northeastern part of Italy, you have what was known as the Most Serene Republic of Venice, which was a republic politically dominated by a small number of extremely wealthy merchant families, and which was one of the most strongest naval powers in the area, and it was also able to put together a pretty impressive army of mercenaries whenever they needed to. Towards the middle of Italy, on the western side, you have the Eternal City, Rome, which during this time was the capital of, of a medium-sized country ruled over by the Pope, which was known as the Papal State. In addition to being the head of the Catholic Church, the Vicar of Christ, the Supreme Pontiff of the Universal Church, etc., popes at this time were also expected to reign as political authorities over a medium-sized state which covered much of central Italy. The popes also controlled wealth from churches all across Europe, so the various church taxes were coming to them basically from everywhere from Spain to Poland and from Naples to Norway. This meant that the popes, in addition to being religious and political leaders, also wielded massive economic power, acting in many ways like the heads of an extremely lucrative international corporation. We'll have a lot more to say about the popes during this time period, but for now we'll just say that failing to balance those three areas of responsibility and power is going to end up making a lot of popes uh, a lot of different enemies. In southern Italy, the foot of the boot, uh, instead of a bunch of competing city-states, you finally have what's a proper medieval kingdom, which was known as the Kingdom of Naples. The Kingdom of Naples was more rural, but it was also pretty wealthy and prosperous with the city of Naples being one of the largest cities in Italy and a major trading port where people came from all over the world. Unfortunately for the city of Naples, people from the countryside who were often moving into that city for work tended to have no immunity to the many exotic diseases that visitors brought in via the port. Naples found itself again and again becoming a hotspot for huge and terrifying epidemic disease outbreaks. Whenever new pandemics would hit Europe, from bubonic plague to cholera, it would be a safe bet that the beautiful and wealthy city of Naples was going to get hit really early and suffer some especially horrific devastation. During most of our story, Naples also has the misfortune of being ruled by a particularly cruel, treacherous, and somewhat unhinged king known as King Ferrante I, who was infamous for keeping the mummified corpses of his defeated enemies around his castle so that he could dress them up in costumes and use them to scare visiting diplomats. The last and most important player in this story is the city of Florence, which was truly the heart of the Renaissance. This wealthy city had been a republic for almost 300 years, ruled by a council of people from the most wealthy families who were known as the Signoria, and they were chosen by the ruler of the city known as the Gonfalonieri. While the city had a long history of different political factions vying for votes and power and occasionally throwing violent coups, during the late 1400s, the famous Medici family dominated politics in the city using the wealth that they had gained from their extremely rich and powerful bank. As we mentioned, the popes were controlling the wealth of the entire Catholic Church, and the Medici had created a role for themselves as bankers to the popes, storing and lending all those massive amounts of money, and prospering immensely in the process. A few generations of Medici had held power in Florence when our story starts, and they'd had a few ups and downs as their business enemies and the other families tried to bring them down, but for the most part, their control over Florence was pretty secure until Savonarola came onto the scene. Now, religiously, the majority of people in every one of the places that Patrick just described were Catholic. This is before Martin Luther and the Reformation, 
So the influence of the Catholic Church over these people was pretty much universal. While there was certainly a lot of vicious and intense religious debate and different opinions and regional variations within the church, uh, it's still a situation where you really didn't want to be viewed as being outside of the Catholic Church. Now, we've mentioned the Renaissance as the name of this time period a few times already, but before we can understand Savonarola and his sect, we need to really define what the Renaissance itself is. It's a somewhat broad term for the rebirth or rediscovery of art, science, and philosophy from ancient Greece and Rome that occurred first in Italy and then spread throughout Europe. The Medici banking family in Florence used some of their wealth to support a huge array of causes, including scholars who managed to translate old works of Greek and Roman philosophy, which had survived through the Middle Ages in the Muslim world, as well as in the old Byzantine Empire. In the 1450s, the newly rising Ottoman Empire captured the city of Constantinople, a truly world-changing event that sent Greek scholars from that city fleeing to find new homes in cities like Florence, where their knowledge and the texts they carried with them were translated and brought back into discussion among the educated Italian elite. As works by people like Plato and Aristotle were being rediscovered in Italy, Italian scholars began building off of them and creating their own new ideas about the nature of reality, and the earliest glimmers of humanist philosophy began to appear, stressing the importance of the human mind and earthly experiences. While the humanist ideas of the Renaissance are sometimes described as in conflict with Catholic ideas, the vast majority of patrons of Renaissance humanism were themselves Catholics, up to and including many popes. The conflict between the newly emerging ideas and medieval Catholic traditions, though, would ultimately be central to the sect founded by Savonarola. Girolamo Savonarola was born in the small Italian city of Ferrara in September of 1452 to a reasonably prosperous family. His grandfather had been a medical doctor of some renown, and his family was able to invest a lot in his education in the hopes that he'd follow in his grandfather's footsteps and become a doctor as well. As he grew up, young Savonarola had what was at the time a pretty standard humanist education that focused heavily on those Greek and Roman writings, and it would later help him to debate and preach against his humanist opponents with a strong working knowledge of the sources that they often drew from. As a teenager and young man, Savonarola for a time tried learning how to play the lute, and he started writing really sad poetry about what he saw as the degraded and corrupt state of his beloved Catholic Church. Though this was, for a while, left out of his official biographies and was something that Savonarola himself tried to suppress, one of his brothers reported that, as much as he loved the church, Savonarola also once fell in love with a young woman named Laodima Strazzi, the illegitimate daughter of the family who lived next door to the Savonarola family. The two would talk to each other from out of their second-story bedroom windows, which were uh, close to each other, but somehow Savonarola's awkward lute serenading failed to win her heart, and she forcefully rejected him when he proposed marriage. Savonarola quickly decided then that he hated her, and soon afterwards would end up taking a vow of celibacy, never again showing any romantic interest in anybody. And I do think it's quite amusing that it's his little brother that uh, made this story survive through the ages. When Savonarola was in his early 20s, he continued writing his sad poetry, but it started becoming increasingly morbid and critical of the state of the world in general and the church in particular. In his allegorical poem, On the Ruin of the Church, written when he was 23, he describes the Catholic Church as a fallen and corrupt woman uh, in ways that make his raging misogyny pretty clear. He starts having holy visions about renouncing the sinful and terrible world, and to the disappointment of his family, he runs away from his doctor studies without their permission and joins the Dominican Order as a monk, declaring that he is not to be a healer of the flesh, but a healer of souls. Known as the Black Friars due to the color of their robes, the Dominican Order were a group of monks dedicated to preaching to the people in vernacular and opposing heresy, which is somewhat ironic as Savonarola would eventually himself become the leader of a heresy. Upon joining the order, he took holy vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience, and for the rest of his life, he would take those first two vows very seriously, but would find obedience to be the vow he could not keep. About a year after joining the Dominican order, he would also be ordained as a priest and would spend his time continuing his studies, though he had shifted from a humanist education to a religious one. He would also practice his preaching and debate skills with his fellow friars. 
While Savonarola was spending the 1470s growing even more intensely religious, politics, intrigue, and warfare in Italy were rolling right along. The city of Florence was being ruled by Lorenzo de' Medici, who would go down in history as Lorenzo the Magnificent. Lorenzo was in charge of the Medici wealth and banking interests as well as the government of the city itself, and was a patron of such renowned individuals as Botticelli and Leonardo da Vinci. The wealth of the Medici was not endless, however, and Lorenzo was spending huge amounts of the family wealth not just to pay for the works of artists like da Vinci, but also on massive parties that could themselves be described as magnificent. Lorenzo was also pretty open about his bisexuality, and like Savonarola, he had a hobby of writing poetry, but whereas Savonarola's poetry was sad and dark and morbid and often about corrupt women, Lorenzo wrote exuberant, popular, and extremely raunchy poems on topics like farmers harvesting cucumbers, which were not subtle. Lorenzo had inherited rule the city from his father and his grandfather before him, and while still technically a republic, there were fears, quite justified as it would later turn out, that Lorenzo dreamed of making the city a hereditary possession of his family and eliminate the need for buying those pesky elections once and for all. While Savonarola had always been disturbed by what he viewed as corruption within the church, his accusations of corruption were not unfounded, at least when it came to the state of the papacy at the time. As we mentioned, the ever-increasing wealth that was flowing into Italy, and specifically the wealth that was going to the popes, were starting to create some startling excesses. The economic and political power that, with, that came with the office of pope was also far more of a concern to the people who held that office than the religious responsibilities. And by the 1470s, the elections of new popes were often rife with bribery and schemes by the various Italian factions who sought to control all that wealth and power. While Lorenzo ruled Florence and Savonarola studied, Pope Sixtus IV ruled in Rome, and he was renowned for his pervasive nepotism as he tried to fill as many powerful positions in the church as he could with his various relatives. Far from being outraged by the concept of a pope granting lucrative church careers to his relatives, Powerful families from across Italy were mostly upset that it wasn't their own family members getting those nice church jobs, and the relationship between the papal state and the city of Florence would soon begin to deteriorate. While popes were of course required to be celibate, there was a polite agreement among the most powerful Italian families to just not talk about the mistresses and children that most popes at the time had. A fairly common practice for popes was to secure for their sons a position as cardinal or other high-ranking positions within the church and these offspring were often euphemistically referred to as their nephews. In 1478, Pope Sixtus attempted to take a large loan from the Medici Bank in order to pay for the rights to some land so that he could then grant that land, along with the church promotion, to one such nephew. The details are a bit complicated, but essentially Lorenzo was in the middle of attempting to buy the same land, and if the Pope and his nephew controlled it, Lorenzo would stand to lose a great deal of money. As a result of these business intrigues, Pope Sixtus plotted with local Florentine enemies of the Medici to have Lorenzo assassinated. Um, two priests working as assassins for the Pope ended up actually attacking Lorenzo in the middle of high mass, killing Lorenzo's brother and only wounding Lorenzo himself. And several of these priests, as well as the Archbishop of Pisa, were executed by the Medici for their involvement in this plot. The idea of an ambitious Pope using church officials to try and murder a business rival outraged Savonarola and his denunciations of corruption within the church began to ramp up even further. At the same time, though, he was also upset by the execution of priests and archbishops, so his resentment against the Medici was starting to grow a little bit as well. Following the assassination attempt, Lorenzo was excommunicated, and the Pope summoned his ally, King Ferrante of Naples, to attack the militarily weak Florence. But in a bold move, Lorenzo personally went to Naples and tried to treat with the murderous and cruel King Ferrante in spite of their impending war. Amazingly, King Ferrante's habit of backstabbing his allies ended up working out in Lorenzo's favor, and Ferrante betrayed the Pope and was somehow convinced to end the war, bringing about a long stretch of peace and prosperity for Florence, which would see the power of the Medici family grow even greater. So it was in the 1480s that Savonarola finally came to the city of Florence, when the city was at peace and under the increasingly tight control of the Medici, with their democratic traditions starting to falter and their leader increasingly in conflict with the Pope. Savonarola was assigned to the monastery at San Marco, 
but he soon found the monastery to be a very poor fit with his vision of Christianity. While Savonarola took his vows of poverty and chastity very seriously, the monks at San Marco Monastery were much more flexible. San Marco was a monastery that was funded directly by Lorenzo and the Medici family, and had been founded to atone for the Medici sin of usury. As a family that made their wealth from banking, the Medici were quite flagrantly in violation of biblical prohibitions against usury, which was often interpreted as charging unreasonable interest rates on loans. However, Savonarola stuck closer to the older definition, which was charging any interest on loans. By any definition, though, the Medici family were guilty of usury, but their supposed charitable donations to the San Marco Monastery did more than simply atone for this sin. As Savonarola quickly discovered, the Medici money paid for fine foods, works of art, comfortable furniture, and an overall plush and luxurious life for the monks at San Marco, which Savonarola saw as a violation of their vow of poverty. Furthermore, San Marco's monks also served the Medici as spies, as their duties brought them in close contact with the common people of Florence, and the monks often informed their patrons about how the commoners viewed them. When Savonarola arrived in Florence, his black robes marked him for a spy, and the poorer classes of Florence that he sought to serve did not welcome him. Since Savonarola was also from the city of Ferrara, his accent clearly identified him as a foreigner, and his early days of preaching in Florence were a notable failure. According to Savonarola, quote, I had neither the voice, nor the strength, nor the ability to preach. As a result, everyone was bored when I delivered my sermons. After years of failing as a preacher and growing ever more sad and lonely, Savonarola was struck by another holy vision, which told him the reasons that the church must be scourged and renewed. And it was through this vision that he formed the core of his opposition to the Catholic Church. Among those reasons were simony, the practice of selling church offices, which by the 1840s had become a standard, almost open practice. These types of holy visions that Savonarola had would continue for the rest of his career, and they were an important part of his preaching and his eventual uh, heresy. We've talked about these types of visions before with other religious leaders on this podcast, which uh, well, of course, it's possible to fake them for cynical reasons. In the case of Savonarola, I think it's very likely that he was completely sincere. His lifestyle included extreme periods of fasting, as well as occasional periods of severe sleep deprivation, as he was concentrating on important religious matters. And his holy visions seem to coincide to some degree with these mind-altering states that he would enter. Uh, and it seems like he was very, very sincere and definitely believed uh, that these were visions directly from God. The vision he had about scourging the church came right around the time when Pope Sixtus died, and was succeeded by Pope Innocent VIII, who began his papacy by openly acknowledging his children and cementing the practice of selling church offices, bringing the Medici family back into a close alliance with the papacy. For the next decade, Savonarola left the city of Florence and became a wandering preacher just north of the city, working to shed his accent and become a more effective public speaker. His growing reputation as a serious and orthodox preacher would eventually bring him back to the attention of Lorenzo de' Medici. By the 1490s, with the Renaissance continuing to flourish in Florence, some of the more unorthodox new philosophical ideas, as well as the older pagan ideas from Greece and Rome, were bringing to Florence philosophers and preachers a reputation for being at odds with Catholic beliefs. These concerns were not necessarily unfounded either, as hermetic mysticism was also making great strides among the educated elite of the city, but that'll be another podcast episode. It seemed at the time, however, that Savonarola was just the man to bring back the appearance of pious orthodoxy to Florence and the monastery at San Marco. While Savonarola was indeed the perfect man for this task, it would turn out to be a grave miscalculation to think he would stop at just the appearance of piety. Very quickly after arriving in Florence again, the Medici family started to regret giving Savonarola a job. While his sermons preaching against the corruption of the church might have been seen with favor back in the days of Pope Sixtus, when the church was arranged against Florence, Savonarola continued preaching against the new Medici-friendly Pope Innocent with the same themes he had always emphasized, corruption, simony, usury, 
and the need for an apocalyptic purge to bring the church back to an earlier state. He soon got himself elected as the head of the San Marco Monastery, and while Lorenzo continued his generous donations to the monastery, Savonarola distributed these gifts to the poor and treated Lorenzo with more indifference than the expected subservience. He also became increasingly involved in the political life of Florence, preaching to the poor and the desperate Florentines and the slums of the city. His sermons began to emphasize his holy visions, and while many in Florence ignored him at first, his constant proclamations of an approaching doom and retribution for the rich of the city of Florence gained him a devoted following among some of the more destitute and desperate citizens. Toward the end of his life, Lorenzo the Magnificent would find himself running low on funds, and he began embezzling from charitable funds in the city in order to buy his son an expensive position as a cardinal in the Catholic Church, which would enrage many of the poor of the city and create an even bigger audience for Savonarola's angry populist preaching. His followers were initially dismissed by the wealthy of Florence, and for the wretched and emotional state they entered when hearing Savonarola preach, they became known as the Weepers. A few short years after his return to the city, Savonarola would see his following grow even more as some world-changing events seemed to prove his prophecies correct. While Savonarola impressed many people with his seeming gift for predicting the future, it should be noted that his control over the monastery at San Marco gave him access to what had long been an established spy network, and frequent visitors from other monasteries across Italy were likewise a potent source of news that was not commonly accessible to many citizens of Florence. As his refusal to cooperate with Lorenzo continued to cause tension, Savonarola was warned by his fellow monks that it was not wise to challenge Lorenzo, to which Savonarola simply replied, Although I am a stranger to this city, and Lorenzo is the most powerful man in Florence, it is I who will remain here, and he who will depart. He will be gone long before me. While this prediction sounded astonishing, in early, early in 1492, Lorenzo the Magnificent died and was succeeded by his heir, who would later become known as Piero the Unfortunate. As you may have guessed from the name, the peace, wealth, and prosperity of Lorenzo's reign would not last long into the reign of his son. Shortly after the death of Lorenzo, Savonarola's enemy, Pope Innocent, would die as well. But once again, a pope would be elected who Savonarola despised. This time, it would be the pretty infamous Pope Alexander Sextus, known before his ascension as Rodrigo Borgia, the man who was to become one of the most intensely hated rivals of Savonarola's life. Borgia had become elected to the papacy quite unexpectedly through a particularly overt flurry of bribery, which Savonarola almost immediately began to preach against in total outrage. The cataclysmic doom and judgment for the city, which Savonarola had foretold, would arrive in force in 1494, in the form of a war which tore through all of Italy. The web of Italian intrigue, betrayals, and alliance between many small states would be thrown into utter chaos by a threat they had all previously hoped would pass them by, a threat which Savonarola would welcome with open arms. It was the death of King Ferrante of Naples that ended the long peace that Lorenzo had maintained in the Italian peninsula. While Ferrante's son attempted to claim the throne, the King of France, Charles VIII, a warlike but outgoing man, also known as Charles the Affable, also possessed a claim to the throne of Naples, and unfortunately for all of Italy, Charles had managed to be at peace with England, the Spanish kingdoms, and every other major military power in Europe, leaving the massive, well-trained, and extremely powerful French army free to invade Naples and claim the rich kingdom for France. Urged on by his ally, Ludovico Sforza, the recently overthrown Duke of Milan, Charles began marching through Italy as the city-states all scramble, trying to decide whether to fight against King Charles or to allow his army to march through their lands on the way to Naples in the south. As Charles began to march, Savonarola began preaching on the theme of a new Cyrus, a reference to the Old Testament and to the historical King Cyrus the Great of Persia, who had conquered Babylon and freed the captive Israelites there. While Charles was not particularly pious, and his war had almost nothing to do with religion, the story of King Cyrus, a pagan king who unwittingly fulfills God's holy plan, was one that had been very familiar to Catholics for a long time. And particularly as Pope Alexander started preparing to oppose Charles, 
Savonarola came to see this invading army as the salvation he hoped for, which would free the church and his city from the corruption he had long sought to destroy. The oncoming French army passed through the first part of northern Italy without much opposition. Ludovico the Moor welcomed the army through Milan, and other cities fed the large and ravenous army as it passed through rather than trying to oppose it. Unfortunately for Italy, Charles had to find huge sums of money to pay and feed his huge military force, and the prospect of sacking rich Italian cities had been the thing that attracted many mercenary soldiers to the army in the first place. So, as those forces marched, Charles began demanding ever larger payments from the people whose lands he marched through. Essentially, they were just itching to pillage any city they could as punishment for defying them. Still, Savonarola preached that this army would be the salvation of Florence. Years before the invasion was launched, Savonarola had preached a sermon in which he claimed, quote, O Lord God, thou hast punished us in the manner of an angry father. Thou hast banished us from thy presence. Make haste with the punishment and the scourge, so that we may be returned to thee. Unleash thy wrath upon our people. With Charles and his army outside the city, Savonarola identified it as the just punishment that the city deserves, saying, quote, O Florence, for your sins, your brutality, your avarice, your lust, many trials and tribulations will be heaped upon you. O clergy, who are the principal causes of so many evils, woe unto you. The last time that Florence had faced such a desperate hour, Lorenzo had put himself in harm's way by going to Naples and talking the enemy king into a peace agreement. With an army at their gates and Savonarola preaching near treason within the city to his followers, Piero the Unfortunate attempted to copy what his father had done, going out to talk to King Charles and convince him to go away. The sequel is never as good as the original, however, and Piero found Charles willing to offer peace only at an extravagantly high price, one intended to humiliate and ruin Piero. Piero accepted the shameful surrender, allowing the French army to occupy Florence. While Piero was off negotiating, Florence was on, a verge of, was on the verge of panic, but Savonarola spent three straight days preaching in an increasingly erratic and apocalyptic manner as st sleep deprivation and stress began taking a toll on him. But his preaching managed to keep the people of Florence united in prayer and averted the riots and looting that many feared was about to erupt in the city. When Piero returned after surrendering to the French, Savonarola and the noble families who had for so long been living under Medici rule united the people against him, and Piero and the Medici were banished from the city with whatever wealth they could cart out, as Savonarola welcomed King Charles as their liberator. What Piero was unable to do, Savonarola accomplished, and despite an extremely tense few days, where Charles attempted to extort as much money as possible from Florence and looked for any excuse to sack it, Savonarola preached to keep the Florentines calm and orderly, and convinced Charles that he would lose the favor of God if he sacked the city. In the end, the French continued to march south, and Florence was left with its power and wealth vastly diminished, its ports seized by the French military, and many of the smaller cities once under its control having been granted independence. To complicate matters, having just thrown out the Medici family, they had also essentially thrown out the whole government, and needed to really quickly create a new one to avoid anarchy. It was at this point that Savonarola, widely acknowledged as having prevented massive bloodshed and saving the city from being sacked, was able to create a theocratic government that aligned with his own interpretation of Catholicism. He created new coins that proclaimed the King of Florence would be Jesus Christ, but underneath this symbolic monarchy, he reinstated the traditional democratic government that the Medici had almost totally subverted, and he invited back all the enemies that the Medici had banished from the city during their reign. The next stop for the French army was Rome, but unfortunately for Savonarola, who hoped that Pope Alexander would fight and be overthrown by the French, Alexander Sextus managed to surrender to the French and remain as Pope. He gave King Charles a huge amount of mule carts loaded with massive amounts of money and tribute. He also gave his adult son Cesare Borgia as a hostage. The second the French king marched away from Rome and on to Naples, however, Cesare escaped and returned back to Rome, stealing back most of his father's money in the process because the Borgias did not become known as the most underhanded schemers in Italian history for nothing. Charles captured the city of Naples easily, then brutally sacked it. He and his army then began celebrating their victory with a massive amount of debauchery and rape. As we mentioned earlier, however, Naples is uniquely situated as a hotspot of epidemic disease outbreaks and in 1495, it was right after Christopher Columbus had returned from his voyage to the Americas. 
His crew had come back infected with syphilis, a disease previously unknown in Europe, and from Spain, they had passed it on to people in the busy port city of Naples. Soon after pillaging Naples, the soldiers of Charles VIII were heavily infected with this slow, painful, and terrifying disease. And as the mercenary soldiers who had come from all over Europe to join this army returned to their homes, they would spread the disease all over the continent, causing a truly horrifying epidemic that would take on religious significance during the rise of Protestantism. But again, that's another story. After the brutal sack of Naples, nearly all of the previously defeated or friendly Italian city-states that Charles had marched through managed to join together in an alliance. With Savonarola in Florence as the only major leader not to oppose the French king on his march back north. Though the combined forces of the Italian states were not enough to really defeat the French army, they did manage to win some victories and gain back most of the wealth that the French had pillaged from them. Soon after he arrived back in France with his army, Charles would die somewhat unexpectedly in an accident, leaving Savonarola and his theocratic reign over Florence alone and surrounded by Italian states who were suspicious and hostile over his refusal to join the anti-French alliance. It was this combination of politics and war that would lead directly to the excommunication and heresy of Savonarola and his followers. Once in control of Florence, Savonarola went about outlawing and punishing every vice he could think of, outlawing adultery, immodest dress, gambling, and other manifestations of what he saw as immorality. To enforce his new laws, Savonarola expanded his network of informers to include impoverished teenagers and young boys who were empowered to roam the streets, spying on everyone and reporting on their parents and neighbors. Again, his misogyny was in full view as he began to preach exclusively to a male audience and use his patrols of young boys to enforce dress codes for women. Though his reign was oppressive, for a time it was still popular, and he expanded voting rights and reduced the number of executions and exiles that the Medici had been using to enforce their rule over the city. Yet as his control over the city continued, Savonarola began to feud more and more with Pope Alexander, who blamed him personally for the failure of Florence to join his holy alliance. The Pope summoned Savonarola to report to Rome, demanding him to comply with his holy vow of obedience and explain his supposed prophecies. Knowing that he would very likely be killed if the Pope ever had him in his power, Savonarola replied by letter, saying that he could not go to Rome, and his excuse was basically, <clears throat> I'm sick. While he refused to come anywhere near the Pope in person, his letter concluded with the following, quote, However, if your holiness wishes to learn what I have publicly preached concerning coming events, such as the ruin of Italy and the renewal of the church, I am in the process of printing a small book on these matters. As soon as this is completed, I shall be most careful to send your holiness a copy. The book, Compendium Revelationum, was about what you'd expect from Savonarola, and it did not shy away from expressing his harsh opinions of the Pope. Following this exchange, Savonarola would find himself close to being excommunicated from the Catholic Church and being declared a heretic. But in his typically self-confident manner, Savonarola took it upon himself to declare the Pope a heretic, claiming, he who excommunicates me excommunicates God. It was this defiance towards the Pope and his declaration that he was receiving prophecies directly from God that caused Savonarola to go from deeply devout and ultra-Orthodox Catholic to being considered a heretical leader basically overnight. In spite of his excommunication, his followers stayed loyal, and his rule over Florence continued, with the city backing his defiance to Rome. In a sermon after his excommunication, he further antagonized the Pope, claiming, Anyone who obstinately upholds the excommunication and affirms that I ought not to preach these doctrines is fighting against the kingdom of Christ and supporting the kingdom of Satan, and is himself a heretic, and deserves to be excluded from the Christian community. His attempts to cleanse Florence of all sin continued, eventually accumulating in the events which he is probably the most famous for, or perhaps most infamous. During Mardi Gras of 1497, Savonarola held in Florence the event known as the Bonfire of the Vanities, in which his opposition to the Renaissance ideals were on full display. 
calling upon the people of Florence to take any object that might tempt them into sin and cast it into a great cleansing fire, Savonarola oversaw the destruction of massive amounts of wealth in the form of mirrors, playing cards, expensive clothes, paintings, books, plays, statues, and any of the Renaissance artwork which had been such an important part of the city's culture under Medici rule. The mass burning of cultural objects has created an enduring legacy in the minds of writers and artists to this day, and it's remembered in sources ranging from The Handmaid's Tale to Assassin's Creed II. While the fanatical Savonarola and his followers known as the Weepers all eagerly participated in this destruction, many citizens of Florence were forced into participating, and the danger of this fanatical heretic monk was finally starting to become obvious. Well, some contemporary historians have tried to frame Savonarola's opposition to the Pope as a precursor to the Reformation, with some going so far as to call him the first Protestant, his opposition to the church always remained rooted to corrupt individuals within the church itself. In a sermon aimed against Pope Alexander, Savonarola claimed, quote, A governor of the church is a tool of God, but if he is not used like a tool of God, he is like a broken tool, all of which are alike. He is no greater than any man. If he says, I have the power, you may say to him, that is not true, because there is no hand guiding you, and you are a broken tool. As his verbal sparring with Pope Alexander dragged on and on, things in Florence only got worse. A tough winter caused a famine, and an outbreak of plague further undermined the faith his followers had in him. The ever-worsening syphilis epidemic, on the other hand, actually helped him hold on to some support, as it was known to be sexually transmitted, and seemed to some as divine punishment for the sexual immorality that Savonarola had always been preaching against. As the Pope escalated their quarrel, and threatened to excommunicate the entire city of Florence if they kept him in power, Savonarola once again turned to diplomacy and politics, and attempted to call major European powers, like the Holy Roman Empire and France, into a great council, to depose the highly unpopular Pope Alexander. In spite of this pretty bold and confident move, however, Savonarola also seemed to be preparing for martyrdom, and he began preaching prophecies of his own impending death, which would allow him one last victory if his conflict with Pope Alexander went badly for him. The escalating challenges finally came to an appropriately dramatic end in 1498, when the Pope challenged Savonarola to a literal trial by fire. A trial by fire was a thoroughly medieval concept, and it was something that had not occurred in Florence for over 400 years. But for the deeply reactionary Savonarola, who had for so long been seeking to turn back the clock in Florence by burning modern art, this was a very symbolically appropriate challenge. The trial by fire would essentially be a contest of fanaticism, with a representative of the Pope and a representative of Savonarola literally walking into large fires with the assumption being that the one who God truly favored would be protected while the other would burn. Massive crowds turned out in Florence to watch this ordeal, which included many of Savonarola's loyal weepers, but also large numbers of Florentines who were fed up with the hunger, poverty, plague, and oppression that had characterized his reign. Many, many more, though, simply showed up eager to see somebody burn to death, and the overwhelming attitude of the crowd mostly seemed to be wanting to enjoy a violent spectacle or see a miracle. The crowd would be disappointed, though, as the fires were lit and the representatives of both the Pope and Savonarola seemed pretty reluctant to actually start walking into the infernos. And the hours dragged on while both sides argued about technical matters. The monk representing Savonarola had showed up in some elaborate blessed red robes, which the papal representative objected to, claiming that Savonarola might have used witchcraft and enchanted the robes in order to cheat. The papal representatives attempted to bring an ornate cross with them into the fire, and Savonarola's people objected on the same grounds. The two sides continued to argue about the rules for hours, and the crowd grew increasingly restless, until at last a sudden rainstorm arrived and put out the fires. While his followers tried to claim this is a sign of Savonarola's victory, the large crowd, bored, hungry, and now soaking wet, viewed this as a sign from God against Savonarola, putting out the fires he had lit and proving him once and for all as a heretic. And he was quickly seized by agents of the Inquisition as the mob turned against him. We don't need to go into too much detail about what happened to him next, but 
Once he fell into the hands of the Inquisition, he was tortured quite brutally, while the city rejoiced and his loyal weepers were forced into hiding. After extensive torture, Savonarola was forced to admit that he had lied about being a prophet, though the confession sent to his followers was not signed in his own hand. He stood by his holy visions for a long time, and while he occasionally would say what the Inquisitors wanted to hear, he would immediately denounce them again and take back his confessions, prompting another round of torture as he attempted to goad the Inquisitors into killing him and making him a martyr. Eventually, in an attempt to demoralize and break his remaining followers in Florence, he was returned to the city where he was hanged, and his body then burned to deny him bodily resurrection and prevent his followers from turning his remains into a shrine. In spite of this, a small fragment of the weeper survived and continued to venerate him as a prophet, and these followers would continue to defend his reputation as a holy man and prophet. There have been several attempts within the Catholic Church to have him canonized as a saint, uh, attempts which continue right up until modern times, though without much success. Later Catholics tend to view Savonarola more or less as a good Catholic, whose heresy was almost entirely based not on his religious beliefs, but on his political actions. Unlike a lot of the sects we covered in this podcast, who split off into a new path from more mainstream religions due to their new and unorthodox ideas, Savonarola and his followers really were just staying stubbornly put while the mainstream church adapted and modernized around them. In this way, there's definitely a connection to later sects, which I'm sure we'll cover, such as the old Catholics, who strongly reject reforms made by later popes, and became heretical for refusing to change rather than instigating change. While still seen by some Protestants as the precursor to Martin Luther for denouncing some of these same corruptions that Luther opposed, Savonarola himself would likely have been horrified by the many emerging sects of the Protestant Reformation, so take the first Protestant claims with a grain of salt. Um, so yeah, what were the, any last thoughts? He's a, a very interesting person, and there's a lot of very over-the-top personalities uh, involved in this story, uh, and a lot of um, intrigue, as, as might be expected in Renaissance Italy. And I think one of the important things that Savonarola's story kind of illuminates is, you know, when we're looking at the origins a lot of, of a lot of the sects that we look at, um, how exactly do they grow? How exactly do they thrive? In the case of Savonarola, his heresy was only able to become, well, quote unquote heresy, was only be able, able to become successful, not just from the sort of religious message he was preaching, but it was a confluence of religious message and political expediency. He had basically all of the factors for a brief time in his favor to allow his followers to emerge. Um, one thing I think that is uh, also interesting about Savonarola, as uh, extreme as his views were and um, scary in a lot of ways in the destruction of the, the bonfire, the vanities, he was a fairly nonviolent person for the most part. He really reduced the number of executions in, in Florence by quite a lot. And again, his I think his most impressive uh, act was saving the city from being sacked. He really just um, ran himself ragged, running around for days on end, doing all that he could in his power to stop this very, very intense situation from escalating. And he definitely saved a lot of people doing that, which was really able to, to give him that first uh, political clout that he used to put himself in control of the city. But Machiavelli, uh, who wrote The Prince, um, had this to say about him, which, which uh, is what Machiavelli viewed as his fatal flaw. Uh, Machiavelli said, quote, if Moses, Cyrus, Theseus, and Romulus had been unarmed, they could not have enforced their constitutions for long, as happened in our time to Girolamo Savonarola, who was ruined in his new order of things immediately that the multitude no longer believed in him and he had no means of keeping steadfast those who believed or of making the unbelievers to believe. Because yeah, he really was, he just used his words. He, he had his followers, but they were not armed. They were not a military force, and he never got involved in the, the warfare that was going on all around him in any way. Um, and of course, Machiavelli would see that as a flaw, but um, I think it's, it's one of the few good things about him. Despite the fact that he wasn't at the head of sort of a military force, uh, he was indeed a head of state. And I think we can, in terms of looking broadly at the sects that we've covered, we can almost make a subset of religious movements 
where it's uh, a religious movement where the leader is a head of state uh, in a sense. You've got Savonarola, you've got the leaders of the cult of reason and the cult of the supreme being, um, and we're going to get into that even more in our next episode as we look at the modest state that rises in the Sudan. And I also do uh, another positive that I like about him is um, his his rule over the city. He did bring back the republic. He did uh, greatly expand voting rights, um, and his rule was one of well the day to day sort of things. He wasn't really interested in the the politics. He tried to keep a, a hands off unless it was his specific mission based uh, his objectives of purging sin. But for the uh, most of the rule of the city that had been dominated by this uh, very authoritarian Medici family, it was seen by a lot as a positive change. Uh, for a while, it, it was in many ways. And yet, in spite of the resurgence of democracy, it's democracy for men. This is a very male story, which I think is a big elephant in the room when talking about him. But I think it's a pretty compelling point that you bring up early on in his story that maybe this misogyny is just rooted in his rejection by the woman that he loved, which would be almost kind of uh, sad and pathetic in a way uh, to have that be the influence so far onward in all of that. And I mean, I'm sure there were, uh, yeah, that being, be, that being the spark, but I mean, it was also uh, quite a misogynistic society in general at the time. It was, um, he wasn't unique in his misogyny. But yeah, that was definitely a, a major part of his beliefs. So yeah, that's Savonarola. And um, thanks again for, for bearing with us with the technical difficulties. And thank you for listening. We want to thank you all for listening. If you're listening to this episode on iTunes, Google Play, any of those sorts of platforms, we'd very much appreciate it if you just leave us a review. We love to hear your feedback, and if you really like this episode, share it with a friend or family member today. This episode of Sex Ed was researched, written, produced, and presented by Michael Albany and Patrick Reynolds, and was edited by Patrick Reynolds. Sex Ed is released under a Creative Commons, Attribution, Non-Commercial, No Derivatives License. It was recorded at Leader, the lab for the education and advancement in digital research at Michigan State University. The views and opinions expressed by Sex Ed do not necessarily represent those of Michigan State University or any of its affiliates.